Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my... Welcome, everybody. Uh, our brother, Donald, is not with us tonight. We're all diligently praying for Mr. Chamberlain, and he should be back soon. We're not going to let him get away with too long of a vacation. Uh, but we have with us tonight, in the order that I see them before me, Mr. Donald Culp from the Buckeye State, who is also our short teacher tonight. He's not short. He's just teaching short. That's it. Maybe. Uh, we have Miss Monica Wilson from the land of Lincoln. Say hello, Miss Monica. Hello. There she is. And then from out there on the West Coast, I will not make fun of her fruits and nuts. Just enough to say she's on the West Coast. There is our beloved Chandra Higgins. Hi. And then, and then Danny and I are deep in the heart of Texas. So, uh, would you like to pray, Miss Chandra? I shall like to pray. I shall. Heavenly Father, we come together here on this Monday night, this wonderful Monday night hangout on air to uh, share a teaching with the world. And we pray for the healing of our beloved brother, John Chamberlain. Uh, we want him to heal quickly, and so we pray that that just whatever it is that's bothering him, whatever it is that the doctors don't know and you know, it just, you know what to do. Obliterate that crap and get him back here with us quickly. And in his absence, we, um, I pray that we do him proud, and, and, and we put together an awesome teaching. Uh, be with, uh, please bless Don Culp here, who is going to be doing a a short teaching here, and I don't know what else is to come tonight, but I know it's going to be good, and I, I pray it just gets out there, and everybody just soaks it all up. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. Well, uh, I have a teaching. You think we should go ahead and do it? Do it. Make him proud. Sounds good to me. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Let's do it then. It'll just make us more peaceful. No just make about God. Yeah, right. All right, let me get this thing opened up here, and we will get set up. All right. We're sticking it in our minds. We're sticking it in our minds. I, that, that, is, that, that is beautiful. <clears throat> beautiful work. Beautiful, beautiful work. Okay. So, I, I have a teaching. And uh, it is actually titled, Shoulda, Woulda, Coulda. Dan and I have been discussing a lot of things this past week. And uh, one of the things that <clears throat> came up is how when you are really focusing in on ministering or, or communicating God's word, a lot of times people will... Bring up the past. Uh, it can get very devilish when people bring up the past. Uh, there was a, a man that was uh, that I respect with all my heart that once said, "Every time the devil reminds me of his of my past, I remind him of his future." Um, mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was always a beautiful little saying. But in dealing in dealing with things that are in front of us. The focus that we give to that attention is very important when it comes to implementing God's power. Uh, for the last several weeks, we have been talking about our revelation and manifestations. And last week, uh, we got a little bit of the starting of spirits. But dealing with matters in a practical manner is part of what we're supposed to learn from the Bible. Uh, Don, ta Don taught earlier about uh, having peace. When you know that you know that you know something true from God's Word, that is such a healing, a healing peaceful thing to uh, know. So uh, what I want to talk about today a little bit is a, a practical matter concerning... Uh, God's Word. 
And in this practical matter, can everybody see my screen? Is it cool? Is it up and running? Thumbs up. Thumbs up? I'm going to pull you guys over there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Philippians, I'm, 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 I'm going to start in Philippians. We're actually going to wind up going to the Gospels and reading a rather uh, good record about uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. But in Philippians, it's addressed to the church of the body. Its primarily function is to reprove practical error that's happening, which is pretty significant to what we've been talking about so far. Uh, not uh, in a, uh, The practical error that the Philippians were experiencing was keeping them from walking in the fullness of the love and the hope that the body, that's why there's so many yees and wees and, uh, in the uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, is because he called us out. He didn't call each individual out. He didn't see all of us from the time that before the foundation of the world when God said, I'm going to have a period of time when I call a group of people out to be uh, attached to my son in such a way that it is going to blow everybody's mind. Uh, and I think that that's what he said. My, my translation, according to my misuses of scripture. But he didn't see every individual, but he saw the group. And that's why it's very important to read the we's and ye's. But there is a section in uh, Philippians that Paul gets into I. And I think it's very important because he is uh, shedding an example to the Philippians, which he does throughout the epistle. He's constantly giving them examples of Christ, examples of other believers, uh, in order to strengthen their walk as a body of uh, believers uh, there in Philippi. Uh, throughout the epistle, Paul compares bad behavior with good behavior with best behavior, uh, using all kinds of illustrations. Uh, this should be every businessman's rule and definitely a focus of the body of Christ. God knows that a lot of problems in the church could be avoided if people understood the practical uh, correction that is available in Philippians because sometimes we get in fights over the stupidest stuff. Uh, whether Adam had a belly button or not isn't worth breaking a church up. Uh, this group isn't having a problem with doctrine presented in Ephesians. Uh, it's the practical application toward one another that is their issue. Now, um, uh, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, where Paul is, uh, again, you see the first word in uh, 3.10, it says, I want you to know. I want, you, I want to know Christ. Uh, Paul, again, as I pointed out, is going throughout this entire epistle giving examples to the believers of how they should walk in unity, which is the first thing mentioned in Ephesians for the practical side of the doctrine of Ephesians. And they were having a little bit of problems in Philippi at this time. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings. Two combinations there. Life, the power of the resurrection, and understanding the sufferings that this man went through. Uh, a lot of Christians don't realize when you signed up at the bottom line and the fine print at the bottom, uh, when it says, I want to be a Christian, Romans 10, 9, and 10, is there is sufferings that you have to endure. And some of these sufferings vary. It doesn't mean you have to be chained to a post and beaten. Sometimes our heart gets hurt so much by things people say when we're trying to show them the truth. And it hurts our heart. That's sufferings, folks. That's dealing. And we're going to see that tonight. To becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Getting through that point. Uh, when you're in sufferings, one thing the Lord promises is as you're enduring things, the hope gets bigger for you. It's evident throughout all the writings, particularly the Pauline epistles. Not that I've already attained this or already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus, the exalted one, took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. I, I don't have a full grip on just how much God's blessing us. 
And then he says, but this one thing I do. And I think this is very pertinent. Uh, and we're going to look at this. Forgetting what is behind me, straining toward what is ahead, I press toward, press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too will God make clear to you. How comforting is that? You don't have to worry about messing up. When you're, when you're striving in this manner, God will show you when you mess up. You don't have to worry about it. He's not going to beat you over the head with a sledge. He's going to lovingly change you for the better. God is always at work doing good. He's always at work doing good. Let us live up to what we have already obtained. Only let us live up to what we already obtained. Now, Philippians 3, this word mature is uh, literally telos. It's a, it's, uh, even though it usually denotes an end, it also talks about a stages to reach an you know, end goal. It's literally talking about people that have worked the word and been in the word for a period of time to where they are functioning in a body of believers and are working the word together. Hey, there's four of them right in front of you. Five. Nana. Well, can't leave Nana. But it says, that for all of those then who are mature should take such a view of things. So this is a real big thing that Paul is pointing out about what he does in his relationship with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I, he's talking about I, it's what he does personally in his relationship. And this word one is literally exclusive from everything else. In other words, this one thing I do, he's pointing out, this is a real big deal for me. This is what I do that really helps me stay in the click. Uh, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward for what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting is literally, would be, a, a, it's this Greek word here that I can't pronounce, although I'm going to try to, but it literally means to let go. You've heard people say this all the time. Man, can't you just let that go? It's the things that <clears throat> let go of what's behind you. And, and part, as I mentioned earlier, part of a big problem in anybody's life, let alone Christians, is that they get distracted for what they should be focusing on. They get, get distracted with a lot of things around them, uh, other affairs and other things that they do not have control over, and it prevents them from dealing with What's right in front of them? And this really can hurt a Christian's walk. It, it hurts my walk all the time. And sometimes we do it on purpose. We, we literally are so distraught by something that's in front of us <laughs> that we avoid it. We stay away from it. We get, we get off and, and we start talking about all these other things that we should be doing or all these other things that we should be taking care of. And that is the context of what's going on here. When you have an issue, Abraham looked at his dead body and said, oh, crap, God's got a good one to pull off here. He didn't ignore his dead body. He didn't look away from it. He focused in on the promise of God and what appeared to his mind to be holding it. And he said he staggered not at the promise of God. He knew God was bigger than his dead body. But forgetting what lies be. Let, let go. Let go of what's behind you. Straining forward is a Greek word uh, uh, that I can't pronounce either. I'm not pronouncing Greek words today. <laughs> it, means, it literally means to reach out and stretch out toward a goal. Uh, Philippians here, Philippians 3, uh, 13, uh, used figuratively as suggesting an intense effort as well as a firm purpose. Straining forward to what lies ahead. And you see, all of these have this imp, imp, and this big letter E at the front of all these. It's, it's being in that, in that, straining in that. And then in 
Prothin is one that I am going to pronounce because I have studied this word before. And I'm going to show you later where it's used before. But it says strain, that putting that strain toward what lies in front of you is literally the text. The head is what is in your face. Deal with it. Deal with what you're being confronted with. That's, that's what this word means, in prothen. It says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be dealing with it, folks. <laughs> you're, you're, we're going to be standing in front of it, and there ain't going to be no, oh, God, I need to be doing this, and I need to be doing that. We're all going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ for rewards and stuff that needs to be cleansed, <laughs> that needs to go away. There's, there's things about us when we gather together that need to go away. Those things need to be burned up because Jesus Christ is going to present a perfect church to God. And in order to do that, uh, that people need to be rewarded and exalted for what they did right. And they need to be cleansed and purged from what they hung on to that wasn't so right. It says that in 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, for we must all appear in prothen before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be facing him face to face when we get there. Uh, the, in for, uh, verse 14, it says, I press, and this is diacom, aggressively chase like a hunter pursuing a catch. I, I mean, if, if any of you have hunted or been around hunters uh, uh, or uh, watched a good movie about a hunter, you can picture a hunter pursuing a catch, going after it. It's an intense, earnest pursuit that is talking. I press. I press it out like a great press, uh, squeezing all the juice out of the situation. On toward, and again, this, this press uh, is also, when you look the word up, it can become confusing because in a lot of places it's used as persecute. Uh, uh, in the same translation, it's persecute. And, and persecution is a pressing. When, pe when you are being persecuted, people are pressing you. They're, they're pressing against you in a, in a negative manner. But this pressing is talking about pressing out something good in the same manner. Not persecuting the way we understand persecuting, but the pressing is the same word in the Greek that is used for persecution. But here, it's, here it's, it's denoting a pressing out. And understand, persecution is the same way. When you're, when you're being persecuted, it's because you're being pressed against. You're being pressed against. But you can also press against good things. Press on toward the goal. The goal, scopas. Uh, like a, uh, a zoom scope and a rifle target. This has some very strong illustrations of hunting in here. Uh, going out to accomplish the kill. Uh, metamorph, uh, uh, the, uh, the word prize is literally only used in two places here in 1 Corinthians 9.24. Uh, it's associated with the word bama. It's on, uh, which properly is a prize or award to a victor. So Paul's context here is forgetting Straining forward, pressing the goal of the prize. Paul was very well aware that Christians would be rewarded for standing on God's word. And God only knows the rewards. There's uh, People talk about the 12 crowns or the five crowns, of, and, I, and I would never stand against that. But I think you're going to be rewarded for a lot more than five specific crowns. There's a lot of things that individuals do in standing on God's word that will definitely be recognized and rewarded at the gathering. But this is Paul's, Paul, again, one thing I do, this thing that he wants. Uh, I, I, I am a Star Wars nut, so my mind goes straight to Yoda and uh, telling young Luke, you never focus. You don't focus. I never focus. He, he's reckless. He doesn't focus on what is in front of him. This is when Luke wanted to go help his friends while he was supposed to be getting training, and he couldn't stay focused. And it's a, it's a pretty cool thing because it is a thing that happens in life all the time, and it's no different in these Corinthians. We get, we get sidetracked on some of those stupid things 
that prevents us from enacting the power of God with his word together the way we're meant to do it. And we need to get better at this. Uh, in verse 17 of Philippians, it says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Again, he's setting forth this, this uh, himself as in something to imitate. Keep your eyes on those who uh, live as we do. For as often as I told you before, and now I'll tell you again, with even with tears, uh, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. The context continues with us looking forward to the hope. And we eagerly await the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Uh, Jesus Christ was a man. Now, Paul's a good example. Timothy's a good example. Peter's a good example. But the, the problem with Christianity today is they try to deify these men to make them more than men. They're, it's St. Peter and St. Paul, the first popes or whatever. Um, to where they were holier than now. Christians even have bad raps. Oh, you think you're so holier than now just because a Christian tries to do good. These people were men. They made mistakes just like we do. And they are sometimes better examples to us than Jesus Christ. That's why they're used in the Christian writings so much. However, Jesus Christ was also a man with like passions as we have. A man. But... The only difference between Jesus and me is he never sinned against God, <laughs> which makes him a very significant man indeed, and one that can be called Lord. But in the record in John 11, verse 1, talking about Lazarus, uh, who was, Jesus was very tight with his family. These were his kumbaya guys. These were uh, Lazarus and his sisters. He was just very, very, very intimately close to kickback like his friends. own family huh kickback friends. yeah kickback friends they were his kickback friends they'd go hang out in town yeah they, he probably had monday night hangouts with these guys i'm mm -hmm. telling you that's probably what it was in verse one it says a man named lazarus was sick he was from bethany the village of mary and his sister martha this Mary, whose brother's Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. That, I mean, this is the one that anointed him for his burial. Uh, so the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I have somebody that I love very much that's sick right now. And it rips your heart out of your chest. When somebody you love is sick, it rips your heart out of your chest. Let alone the fact of what actually was going on here as we read through this, how it much must have touched the Lord's heart. And when he, Jesus, heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. That's a, that's a command of the Lord. That's a command of the Lord. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, a lot of people wow. use this scripture in such a horrible way because they God made Lazarus sick so Jesus could be glorified. That is a bunch of bunk. Number one, as we'll read this and we look at this in detail, we're going to find out Lazarus was already dead by the time the message got to the Lord. So Jesus Christ, by revelation, knew this. But we, by reading the mere record and putting one plus two plus one together, seeing four, we'll be able to see that he had already been dead in other words, the servant took some time to get to where Jesus Christ was. And by the time the servant got there, Lazarus was dead. 
Jesus Christ isn't saying is because look at the next verse. This is really it says it says uh, when he heard this, Jesus said, "The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God, so that God's Son may be glorified through it." Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there. He stayed where he was for two more days. And people say, well, yeah, people, yeah, he wanted him to die. So, no, if Lazarus was sick, Jesus Christ would have hightailed it over to him, just like he offered to do with the centurion servant. He wasn't sick. He was already dead. Jesus Christ knew he was dead by revelation. After the two days, verse 7, and he said, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Jerusalem. <laughs> his disciples, Judah. Judah, thank you, Judea. Uh, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, these Jews were trying to stone you, and yet you're going back? The, they weren't too hip on the idea of going back. Also, they're trying, look, at I want part of this record I want you to see is just how much Jesus Christ was distracted from this revelation. He's constantly being distracted from this revelation. Now, the so then in the Greek phrase, has nons, that starts in this verse should be translated, so then, as many modern versions do. Uh, therefore, or therefore, when he heard this, although almost all versions end in verse 5 with a period and start verse 6 as a new sentence, the text does not have to be punctuated that way. The Greek connection on ties the two verses together. The point of this verse 5 is so that uh, the continuative uh, uh, that is grabbed by our attention, the counterintive, that is grabbed by our attention and requires study. Because the idea, he stayed there for... Two more days. Stayed where he was. It should snag your attention and requires prayer and reflection. They say that it was because Jesus loved Mar Mary, Martha, and Lazarus that he stayed there. He was for two more days. But how can that be? There are several reasons, but the major part of the record is that when he heard from the messenger that Lazarus was sick, he knew by revelation that he was dead. He stayed two more days. When we piece together what we know about the character of God and Christ, the geography of the area, the four-day time period involved, and the belief that people at that time, we can see both why Jesus knew Lazarus was already dead when the messenger arrived and told him Lazarus was sick, and also by uh, also why Jesus waited two extra days to raise him from the dead. As to the character of Christ, that we walk in love, and would, he would never let a person die from sickness if it could be prevented. Nothing needs to be said. If Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick and could have arrived in time to keep him from dying, he would have left immediately to help him. However, it seems most likely that sometime around the arrival of the messenger, Shortly before they arrived, or just as they arrived, God let Jesus know Lazarus was already dead. That kind of revelation is quite in character with the entire Gospel of John. Uh, the first day that Jesus began to gather his disciples, he demonstrated that he walked with God by uh, renaming Simon and calling him Peter. A uh, very short time after that, he told Nathaniel that he saw him under the fig tree. Jesus said he knew what was in people, and many other verses in John highlights and confirms his walk by revelation. God telling Jesus that Lazarus had died explains why he did not immediately leave for Bethany. F.F. Uh, F. Ruth writes, Lazarus must have died shortly after the message which dispatched, and Jesus knew that he had died. The Gospel, uh, that's in the Gospels and the Epistles of John. Uh, Leon Morris concurs in his writings that uh, the therefore, or the so then, as uh, the REV translates it, that uh, opens in verse 6, cannot mean that Jesus deliberately waited for Lazarus to die. 
Indeed, the death must have already taken place when the messenger arrived. Uh, the New International Commentary on the New Testament of the Gospels according to John. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, scholars that concur the fact that there's no way that this was in the character of this man, Jesus. So, as of the geography and the timing of the four days, we do not know exactly where Jesus was staying. John had been baptizing in Bethany beyond the Jordan, uh, and the exact location of that place was unknown. However, it's most likely uh, close to the Jordan River across from the Jericho, since the other uh, Bethany is the, ta uh, is the town of Lazarus was east of the of Jerusalem, it would not have been as a full day's journey to go from there, where Jesus was staying to where Lazarus was buried. Lazarus was buried, had been dead for four days when Jesus arrived. Leon Morris uh, writes, the four days are an account for, by allowing a day for the journey of the messenger, two days that Jesus remained where he was, and a day for Jesus' journey. Uh, in the culture of Palestine, burials occurred the same day as the person died, and uh, by the time Jesus arrived, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. So a vital thing in understanding, uh, in order to uh, see this record more clearly, is why Jesus would stay there for two more days, the answer to that question comes from the belief of the people, uh, rabbinic literature that would have occurred in the intertestamental period uh, from after the time of the New Testament shows that uh, rabbis taught that the soul hung around in the body for three days looking for an opportunity to re-enter it. But when uh, the decomposition set in, on the fourth day the soul left the body. Uh, and there's commentaries on that uh, in Leviticus 15, uh, Levitas 15.1. Although that particular robotic uh, 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 commentary postdates the New Testament, Jesus purposely staying away from Bethany for four days is good evidence that the belief was in existence at the time of Christ. Uh, even though Lazarus died close to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, the death and resurrection of Christ was still unknown to the apostles and the disciples. Jesus had told them over and over about it, but they just didn't grasp it. The cultural belief that the soul would not re-enter the body after three days would have made Jesus' resurrection very hard for some people to believe. That Jesus raised Lazarus after four days would confirm to the people that God could raise the dead even if they had been in the grave for four days. Jesus' powerful miracle of raising Lazarus showed that God could raise the dead even after four days and helped people, even the apostles, believe in the resurrection. This is clear from 11.15. I am glad I was not there to heal him so that you may believe. The raising of Lazarus did something besides get people to believe Jesus was the Messiah and believe in the resurrection. It was because of the miracle of raising Lazarus that the enemies of Jesus went into high gear in their plans to kill him. Jesus' miracle in raising Lazarus after he had been dead was so great and so undeniable that many of the Jews believed in him, as recorded in John 11:45. In contrast to those who pure, in contrast to those pure-hearted Jews, the religious leaders realized if they let Jesus go on doing miracles, everyone would believe in him, and the Romans would come and take away their their, their powerful state, and nation, and their status. Uh, when uh, Cleophas prophesied that it was better for one man to die than for the nation of Israel to perish. The result of all this was from the very day that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. From that day on, they made plans to kill him. It was only in a short time later, at the time of the Passover, that their plans were fulfilled and Jesus was crucified. 
It was Jesus' delay to go to Lazarus that made the raising of Lazarus so amazing and undeniable and started the intense religious fervor to arrest and kill Jesus. Jesus had said that Lazarus' death was to the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. And now we can see the fullness of what he meant. The death and resurrection opened the door for God to be truly glorified by giving his son, his only son, a provide, and provide for the salvation of mankind so that anyone who believes could have everlasting life. So uh, that is out of the, that is a writing out of the Revised English Standard. I think it's very, very good and very accurate. But I want to continue reading through this record because we got Jesus heading out now with what we've just read. In verse 9 it says, Jesus answered them, because they told him, we don't want to go there, they're going to kill us. Jesus answered them, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daylight will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. <laughs> His disciples should be on a sitcom, comedy hour. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. <laughs> Jesus had been speaking of his death but his disciples thought he meant a natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also knowing, known as Deuteros, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us go, and we may all die for the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was around the group of the closest people I had, and I had a revelation from God to do something like this, and then one of the leaders named Thomas is, we're going to march into death here. Uh, the distractions about this thing are just phenomenal. The things that Christ is, is put off by. Number one, he knew that Lazarus was dead. Number two, he knew the benefit of waiting four days before he went back so that the glory of God could truly be shown. And, it, and he has nobody here with him. I mean, he has the guys with him, but they're all, there's no fellowship here for him. He truly did a lot of things alone. And he didn't, I mean, he's not persecuting these people because of it, but he does constantly try to bring them to a higher faith. In verse 17, it says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Y'all seeing this? Been dead for four days. Jesus stayed there for two days. The trip would have taken one day for him to get there and probably one day. So by the time the messenger got to Jesus, Lazarus probably was already in the tomb for a day. He probably would have died almost right after the messenger um, left. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. And, and this next verse is so, remember, Jesus loved these people. Lord, Martha said, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. This is not a glorification of Jesus's being and presence. This is a, you weren't here and he died. You're, if you would have been here, it's a, he, she's pissed. She's angry at him because he wasn't there and he died. Uh, she's condemning him. She's judging him. She's very angry right now. Uh, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Now this sounds all hunky-dory. And Jesus said unto her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. These people had trust in a resurrection of the dead from the Hebrew scriptures. At the, where's the resurrection? 
at the last days. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And moreover, live. Uh, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, this is, this is kind of cute because he asked her a very specific question about her belief. And she said, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God who's come into the world. And does not answer his question. She is telling him what she thinks he wants to hear because she didn't listen to what he asked her. So she's, don't get me wrong, her brother just died. She's very upset, and we all know how distraught people can become when, when somebody's sick, let alone when somebody has died. And this continues. Now, Jesus Christ had a revelation. He's come here to get this guy up. And the, the, the people that he loved are badgering him. Verse 28, after she said this, she went back and called her sister uh, aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary, now this is Mary, the girl that anointed his feet with oil. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at her feet and said, If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. This, this is an angry speech. This is, this is, she's, they're angry that he wasn't there to save them. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was so deeply moved in spirit. He was hurting. He, he, he moved. He was, he's, he's hurting because these people are so, so, they're not only hurting, but they won't believe. They won't rise up and believe. And troubled, where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And the shortest verse in the Bible, 35, Jesus wept. I mean, how would you feel? And people think, the Jews said, oh, look how he loves them. No, <laughs> that's not what's going on here. These people are his friends. They love. He loves them. And look at how they're treating him when all he's trying to do is stay focused on the word. Then the Jews said, see how long he loved, see how he loved him. But some of them said <laughs> the same badgering. Could not he have opened the eyes of the blind, have kept this man from dying? If he had been here, it wouldn't have happened. What's the matter with this guy? He, he's off the program. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across it, the, across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead, it's going to stink. <laughs> Just one can't do after another can't do after another problem, trying to distract this man from doing what by revelation he knew to do. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believe, you will see the glory of God. I mean, what more could you say? He's trying to raise their faith. He's trying to show them the magnitude of what was about to happen to signify just who he was. In 41, so they took away the stone. When Jesus looked up, he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said it, he called with a loud voice. <laughs> I would love to heard this one. Lazarus, come out. Now, it doesn't, I got a <clears throat> head cold. Excuse me. You won't get that from every minister doing the word. Uh, when he called with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And 
He came out. The dead man came out, and his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his, cloth around his face. Jesus said unto him, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Uh, there is illustrations all the way through the Gospels of this man, Jesus Christ, uh, standing for God and doing and staying focused on the purpose of God by what he knew from the Word of God. And the Word of God said that this man would raise a dead man. That was part of the Masonic prophecy. But he was, if you look at these records closer and see how much opposition he had as he stayed focused, and as you start reading the Christian writings and the Hebrew writings, to see every time somebody was given a command from God, how much opposition they had, and the people that received the promise, how focused they stayed, then you can see a lot more about woulda, shoulda, coulda. I'm not so worried about what happened, why it happened, what's going on. I'm more interested in what can we, through Christ, do about it. So, anyways, that's my deep